How's everybody tonight? Good. It's good to see everybody, even in the rain. Again, thank you, Lord, for the rain today, and uh, it is good to be here with you. Brother Tim had to go to Monticello today. Uh, his uh, children's minister that was there whenever he was at Monticello is retiring, and so they were offering a retirement service for her. Uh, so he and Miss Naomi went down there to be with them and to celebrate that uh, monumental moment with them. So pray for them as they travel back in the rain this evening, uh, make it back home safely. Uh, so I'm going to open us with a word of prayer, and Taylor is going to come and lead us in some worship songs tonight, uh, and then I'll be back up here to uh, present a message for us tonight. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. Again, we thank you for the rain. Uh, we thank you for each person that has made it here tonight uh, in order to worship you and to learn more about you and how to live our lives in a way that pleases you. God, I pray that as we uh, go through this time of worship, Lord, that we would just sing uh, songs of praise and open up our hearts to, to um, what you have for us. Uh, God, just speak through me tonight. Be with Brother Tim and Miss Naomi as they travel. Uh, we thank you for the leadership that they uh, bring for our church right now. It's your name I pray. Amen. All right, if y'all would like to... If y'all would like to stand and sing, uh, we're going to start off with Mighty to Save.
Y'all can be seated. Again, it's an honor to be here tonight to stand before you and uh, be able to present God's Word to us uh, as we open God's Word tonight. Uh, before we get started, uh, I got in trouble this afternoon. I just want to go ahead and let everybody know that. I got in trouble this afternoon at the house. Uh, April said that I did not make this lovey, mushy post on Facebook uh, in regards to our anniversary today, uh, 18 years today. So here it is in front of everybody. She's the color of her dress right now. If you can't tell that, she is blushing. Uh, but happy anniversary. Uh, I love you, and I thank you for all that uh, you've done for me over the years, encouraged me, and so call me out next time. See you. I'll get in trouble when I get home, too, again. <laughs> We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3 tonight. So if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles there, uh, we'll be looking there. While you're turning there, uh, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, there was a middle-aged man who decided that he would compete in his first ever 10K race. Now, if you don't run, if you don't know anything about how far that is, that's 6.2 miles. Uh, and his only goal in that race was to finish the race. On his own, he didn't have a time that he was trying to beat. He wasn't trying to beat so many people. He just wanted to finish the race. But unknown to this man... This was not just a standard road race that was a 10K. It was an off-road race, which meant that there were hills and valleys that he'd have to go up and down, and he didn't know this. So he was very unprepared. But as he started off, the first part of the race was not very bad. It was just some kind of small hills and little short valleys, and he thought, you know what, this isn't so bad. But then he entered the midway point of the race and looked before him, there was what appeared to be Mount Everest in front of him. And he begins to kind of get worried that, that maybe he'd bit off more than he could chew, but he's going to push through because his only goal, like I said, was to finish the race. So as he started up the hill, this man in his 70s easily passed right on by him which was a little bit discouraging. He was a little bit disappointed at the fact that this elderly man just went on by him without a problem, but he kept going. Not too far, much further along, this little old lady passed him, and, and you know she kind of looks over at him with pity in her eyes, and he, again, he can just feel the encouragement just draining out of his body as she looks at him with this pity. And then a little bit further along, another runner comes up beside him and and at this point, he is just completely given out and he waves his hands at the man and says, you can have it. And he stops and puts his hands on his knees and, and just kind of stands there for a minute huffing and puffing. And with that, the man, the other runner, turns around and kind of jogs in place and says, no, come on, you can do it. Keep going. You can do it. I'll run with you. So the newfound partner's encouraging words began to ring in this man's ears and he began to find some new life and some new energy that wasn't there the first part of that heel. And he began to keep going. The encouraging words gave way to tips and pointers of how to make the conquest up the heel a little bit more possible Things like lean forward as you climb the hill or shorten your stride just a little bit or control your breathing as you're going up the hill. Slowly, the top of the hill came into view and with it, the end of the race was now in sight. And for the last part of the race, the two men jogged alongside each other stride for stride and finished the race. What seemed like an impossible goal, what seemed like an impossible task as the man started became something that he could finish with encouragement. It just took that little bit of encouragement, someone going along with him to finish the race. Our spiritual life as a believer has often been compared 
to the life of a runner. Many, many times in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Galatians 5, 7 says, You are running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? And 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Don't you know that the runners in the stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. As many times in Scripture, in the New Testament, and in Paul's letters specifically, that he talks about running the race, Paul must have enjoyed running. Paul, I could see Paul being one of those guys that, that when he's got something on his mind, maybe he put on his, his jogging sandals and, and he just took off on a little run just to kind of clear his head or something. As many times as he talked about running, Paul must have liked to run. I don't know that. I'm just assuming. But just like with any physical running, spiritual running, it becomes tiresome. It becomes difficult. It's during these times when we need a running partner to issue words of encouragement and pointers to help us finish the race. And obviously, the best encourager that we can have is Christ. Christ can be our running partner on this road of trial and sufferings because He's done it before. When He says to us, hey, I want to help you if you'll just listen to me, if you'll just do what I'm suggesting, if you'll just do what I'm asking you to do and trust me, we can know that He'll be there for us. So it's up to us to decide when we're running this spiritual race if the effort is worth the reward. As we're going through life, we've got to look at our life, we've got to look through all the trials and everything that we're going through, and we've got to decide, is the effort that I'm willing to put in worth the reward of heaven? And I would hope we all would say, yes, absolutely it is. But sometimes that's hard to see when we're in the middle of those trials and sufferings. We ask ourselves, Will we fix our eyes on Jesus and experience His spiritual stamina and His powerful peace? Or we throw our hands up and exclaim, exclaim, You won. I can't go on any further. As we come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, there's a little bit of background I wanted to give to you. Paul is writing to a young, his young protege, Timothy, And he knows that things are about to become more difficult. He knows that things that become difficult are going to include persecution, false teachers, and even disagreements within the church. Now I know that's hard to imagine that there would be a church out there that does not have, or that has disagreements, but it does happen, even in Paul's time. And it's believed that 2 Timothy is probably the last letter that Paul ever writes from his jail cell before his death. With Paul knowing that that day is probably coming, he writes with urgency. He writes with with an attitude of making sure that Timothy has all the information that he needs for him to succeed. And in chapter 3, we see that Paul expresses the downward spiral of society in general and how much worse things will become in the days that will come. So tonight I want us to read uh, chapter 3. And I want us to look at at the words and the encouragement that follows in the light that we are so much closer to the end of days as Paul was when he wrote these words. So if you would, let me, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited lovers of pleasure 
rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, uh, but denying its power. Avoid these people. For among them are those whom their way into their house, worm their way into their house, into the households and deceive gullible women, overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Just as James and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. They are men who are corrupt in mind and worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be clear to all, as was the foolishness of James and Jambres. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted." Evil people and impostors will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known and sacrificed, known the sacred scriptures which were able to give the wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank You for the words that have been passed down to us from generation to generation. And God, as we are reading about the last days and the things that are to come, Lord, let us realize that we are in the last days. Help us to realize that that the things in this Scripture are not only true, but they are here with us today. And God, help us to find the encouragement that we need to get through these days. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So the first thing I want us to look at is our verses uh, 1 through 9. And then when it's talking about the difficult times that are ahead, I want us to think about my analogy earlier, the hill that's coming. This is the hill that we're faced with in life today. These last, Paul makes it clear that hard times will come in the last days. Now these last days, now we think we're 2,000 years removed from Paul writing this, and we think, well, my word, we've got to be in the last days. Well, of course we're in the last days, Because when Paul wrote this, he meant the last days as in the time between when Jesus ascended back to heaven and when he returns here on earth. He didn't know how long that was going to be. All he knew was that was going to be the end. Those were the last days. And here we are 2,000 years later and we're still waiting on those days. I want us to think about this. When it describes difficult times, other translations may use the word terrible times. And as believers, we must be prepared for these hard or difficult times that are ahead of us. In the analogy that I used earlier, in the story that I said I talked about earlier, if the runner had been prepared, if he had known in advance that that hill was coming, and he trained himself for that hill, then it wouldn't have been that bad. But because he wasn't prepared, because he didn't know about it, it made it all that much worse. So believer, I'm here to tell you tonight, difficult times are ahead. I'm preparing you, I'm warning you, if you didn't already know that, which I feel like most everybody in the room probably did, but if you didn't know, here's your warning, here's your preparation, difficult times are coming. But we can take heart, we can take peace, we can take comfort in knowing that it's all part of God's plan. There's not a day that is about to come that is difficult that God doesn't already know about, that He hasn't already scripted in how it's going to play out. So how do we know what those days are going to look like? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. 
in verses 2 through 5, we see what those days are going to look like. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that sound like the days we're living in right now? I don't know of a one of those descriptors that, that Paul wrote here that we couldn't look at today's world, today's society, and say, yeah, I see that in today's world. But we've got to think, Paul wrote this, like I said, 2,000 years ago. Ever since the resurrection of Jesus and His ascension into heaven, these attributes of man's moral decay have been slowly eroding our society away. Eventually, that erosion will result in the return of our Savior and King. Eventually, our world is going to become so bad that, that God the Father is going to look at Jesus and say, Son, go get my children. And oh, what a day that will be. Here's what we see in these attributes. As man begins to pull himself further away from his spiritual dependence on God, he begins to turn to his own ideas for what is truth and what the purpose of life is. Think about our society today. We're a nation that, is, that was founded on the principles of a God-fearing society and now we have rebelled against the teaching of godly truth so much that we can't even define some of the simplest truths. Things like the definition of a woman. Things like when life begins. Things like the sanctity of marriage. Our society today refuses to say what these truths really are. But here's the thing. While it's easy to think that these problems are only occurring outside of the church, and this is a, a worldly problem that we're faced with, there are more and more progressive churches that are popping up and going along with this mainstream idea of what truth is. They're popping up and they're, they're bowing down to what the world says is true and it is infecting the body of Christ. Satan realizes that the best way to destroy the church is not from the outside, it's not from people pouncing on the church and saying, oh, you're a bad person, you're, you're a hateful person because you don't believe me. No, he knows the best way to destroy the church is from the inside. If he can get enough woke-minded people within the church to start turning the church against God and godly truths, then he knows he's won or he thinks he's won. It's easy to see these attributes in our world today, but <clears throat> I don't want to focus on the attributes so much as those that promote these attributes. You see, pastors today uh, that, who promote their own self-help books to make our lives better. But in actually, actuality, we aren't meant to rely on our own wisdom, knowledge, or understanding to our lives Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 reminds us to trust in the Lord with all our heart, to lean not on our own understanding, and in all our ways acknowledge Him, and He will make our paths straight. We see pastors who are focused on their own financial gain that they push aside the mission of the church to spread the gospel. But 1 Timothy 6.10 tells us, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 
We see pastors today who are so proud and boastful about their own social media followers or how many likes or how many how many likes they have on their posts or how many views they have on their videos that they've lost the message that they're supposed to share. Proverbs sixteen eight says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. I could go through each one of these characteristics of a false teacher and the immoral behavior that they have and a Bible reference that, go, that counters it, but that's not what I want to go talk about tonight. The point I want to make tonight is that because we have leaders who are presenting a false gospel, we have a generation of people who think that living biblically, tr- biblical truths should not be contradictory to worldly fantasies. Let me say that again. The point I want to make tonight is that because we have leaders who are presenting a false gospel, we have a generation of people who think that living biblical truths should not contradict worldly fantasies. I want to encourage you to do the same thing that Paul encouraged Timothy to do at the end of verse 5. Avoid these people. Avoid them. Don't have anything to do with them. Don't listen to them. Don't follow them on social media. Avoid them with everything you can do. Be careful who you listen to and who you learn from. We need to do our own research on what biblical truth is. And when we hear it presented to us, when we hear somebody say, well, this is what the Bible says, we need to know. We need to go and do the research ourselves We don't need to just hear a message. I hope that you go home tonight and and you read this and you study it for yourself this week and see if what I'm telling you is truth. I hope that it comes back in your heart and in your mind that what I'm telling you is truth. We don't need to just open up Facebook or or YouTube or TikTok and follow uh, these preachers and just say, well, they're preaching the gospel. I'm just going to listen to what they say. We need to go research what they're supposedly preaching. We need to study it in context. We need to know what God's Word says for ourselves. But notice how Paul says these false teachers work in verses 6 and 7. For among them are those who worm their way into households and deceive gullible women, overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, before anybody throws anything at me tonight, all any of you ladies throw anything at me tonight, I don't think that Paul is trying to slander any woman in any way. I don't think he's trying to say that women aren't able to discern biblical truths on their own. Here's what I do think he's trying to do. I think he's trying to call out the men. I think he's trying to call out the men and saying, hey, man... You should be the leader of your home. You should be the one making sure your family is grounded in biblical truth. You're the one that should be making sure someone else is not coming into your household and preaching a false gospel. This idea goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. If, man, if Adam had been leading his home, God had given Adam the instructions on what to do, not eat the fruit. And if Adam had been doing what he was supposed to in leading Eve, it might not have happened. So when we think about these false teachers worming their way into our homes, I got to thinking, what's the most common way that these false teachers are coming into our homes today? They're not not walking and knocking on our doors. Right here. Right here on our phones, on our tablets, on our computers, through social media, through videos that somebody shares with us. It's right there. That's the best way that they're gaining access to our homes, and we've got to avoid them. We've got to know what the false teachings are, and we need to avoid them. Paul concludes these thoughts by comparing these false teachers with the names 
And I know I've butchered them. Janes and Jambres is the best way I know how to pronounce them, but it got, to, got me to wondering, who are they? I've never seen these names anywhere else in the Bible, anywhere else in Scripture. So who are they? So a little bit of, if you haven't done your research, here it is. Uh, these names are the names given to the magicians in Pharaoh's court who opposed the acts of God when Moses and Aaron were trying to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, why would Paul reference these magicians when talking about false teachers? Again, that's a good question. Let's talk about that one. So these men, these magicians were opposed to Moses and the Israelites being free. They were opposed to it and they were willing to, to face God's power to make sure those Israelites remained enslaved. These false teachers that Paul is talking about are willing to do the same thing. They're willing to oppose God's power and present a false gospel to make sure anybody who listens to them remains enslaved to sin. But only the true gospel of God's love can free us from that captivity. And as Paul states in verse 9, they won't make any further progress because their foolishness will be made clear. Because if we're avoiding those teachers to begin with, if we're discerning what biblical truth is on our own, then we're going to understand their foolishness. We're going to understand that what they're teaching is false, and we're going to say, you know what? I'm not listening to it. I'm not going to be led astray by this harmful lifestyle that's going to prevent me from finding freedom in Christ. So that's the hill that we are facing. That's the hill that we are looking forward to. Everybody excited? Everybody ready to go charge up that hill? We need a little encouragement, right? We need a little bit of, come on, go with me. We need an encouraging partner. In verses 10 through 17, Paul points out to Timothy, he doesn't have to go on this hill alone, and neither do we. As I said earlier, we know Christ is going to be there with us. We know that He's going to be there with us all the time, but sometimes it's good to have a physical encourager to go along with us too. We can view Paul's life as an encouragement to us. We can look at other lives around us as an encouragement to us. But let's look at Paul's tonight and see how he can give us the encouragement through his life. As Paul concludes his last thought back in verse 9, by saying that these false teachings will be seen as such, he confirms that the example of his life will be met with acceptance because his life bears the fruit of a true follower of Christ. Paul's basically saying, look at their life and what they teach, and look at my life and what I teach, and compare the two. Compare what they're telling you and compare what I'm telling you, and you're going to find that my life and what I teach is true. He's, he's not making any bones about it. He's standing firm in what he says. You have followed my teachings, my conduct, and my purpose. You've seen me. His life, his teachings, his testimony, his purpose has stood the test of time because we're still talking about his life, his teachings, his purpose 2,000 years later. But never forget what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, imitate me as I, also, as I also imitate Christ. Paul knows that his life should not be the standard that we're supposed to live by. He understands that Christ's life is the imitation that we're supposed to stand by. He's just saying, follow me as I do what Christ told me to do. And that's exactly what we want to do tonight. Paul was clear that God's truth was foundational in everything that he taught. Paul's, uh, Paul was, uh, he knew that when others looked at his life, it would be found with the utmost purity of God's love. And he always made it a point that the purpose of his life was to fulfill God's glory. 
So while Paul was preaching and he was giving these instructions to this young preacher, Timothy, that doesn't mean that there's not something that we can take a hold of this from our life today. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Do you know God's truth well enough that if you hear false teaching, you can call it out? You know, just the moment you hear it, you think, there's something off about that. There's something that's just not quite right. Do you know false teaching? You may not know exactly what it is the first time you hear it, but you know that there's something there. Second question, do others see the purity of God's love for them when they see your life? When others look at your life from day to day, do they see God's love for them in your life? Do they know that when they come across you, even if you've had a bad day, you're still going to love on them? You're not going to lash out at them? Even if you have a difference of opinions, are you still able to share God's love? Last question, do you live each day with the purpose of fulfilling God's glory? Do you wake up every morning saying, God, how can I serve you today? God, give me someone that I can witness to today. God, give me someone that I can show your love to today. Those are hard questions to answer sometimes. But how does Paul suggest that we do these things? First of all, he says we need to live a life of faith that defines how much we trust God in every situation. Faith. Trusting God in every situation requires faith. And when others see that kind of faith in our life, they're going to look at us and they're going to know something's different. It's living a life of patience that defines our understanding that God's sovereignty is over every situation. It's knowing that even in the highs and the lows of life, in the ups and the downs and the joys and the sorrows, God's in control. And having the patience in all of those situations to sit back and say, God, I'm going to wait on you. I'm not going to rush it. I'm not going to go forward before you. I'm going to be patient and wait on you. And sometimes that's hard for us to do. It's living a life that defines God's sacrificial love for us. It's going out and sacrificially doing something to help others. It's living a life that is the definition of endurance even in the middle of those trials and sufferings. When we talk about going up that hill, you've got to have endurance. You've got to push forward with endurance because if you sprint up it, you're never going to make it. The same is true with our life of following Christ. We must have endurance. You see, Paul reminds us in verse 12 that the life of a believer, there will come persecution. Just because we're a follower of Christ, the one who controls life itself, doesn't mean that there won't be times when we face opposite, when we won't face opposition. In fact, Because our lives are supposed to be so drastically different from the world, that's the reason that we should expect opposition. As I was thinking about this idea of of, false teachers and differences of of living for Christ and living for the world, and this idea of if the world tries to tell me that something's okay... I better really second guess whether that's really okay. In today's society, the world is trying to tell us what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right so much that if the world is trying to tell us, hey, this is the right way to live, then we really need to evaluate what Scripture says about that. Used to, they'd try to sugarcoat it and bring it in the back door or whatever you want to call it to make it where it's not so hard to swallow. 
But now they're shoving it down our throats. It's right in our face. They're not hiding their pretense anymore. We've got to know what this says. We've got to know what the Bible says about what they're trying to make us believe. But notice the encouragement that Paul offers to Timothy in verses 13 through 15. Evil people and imp uh, imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures which are being able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. First is the warning of the evil and deceitfulness that's coming. But then he follows that with a reminder of who Timothy is and what he's capable of. Continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. In order to continue something, you've got to start it to begin with. Have you started understanding the Scripture? Have you started discerning what God's Word has for your life? If you have, then continue. Don't stop. Continue in what you're doing. Because continuing means don't give up. Keep on doing what you've been doing. And as a disciple of Christ, we must never stop learning how to live a life that follows Him and our desires to serve Him. We should constantly desire to learn more and more of His Word and what it has to say about our lives. It's that, this idea of sanctification that comes to mind when we hear this. It's the thought that we need to do everything that we can to grow in our relationship with Christ and the image that we present of Him. Or a simple way of saying that, I want to be more like Christ today than I was yesterday. I want to look more like Christ tomorrow than I did today. This process of sanctification continuing to grow in our relationship with God. But Paul goes on to say we must believe it. If we don't believe what we've learned, then we'll never be able to live out that truth in our lives. Do you believe everything that Scripture says is true? Do you believe that, that we have salvation and that God has a desire to have a relationship with us? If so, are you living that out? Are you living that truth out in your life? And Paul reminds Timothy who taught him. He, we know earlier in the book, and in 1 Timothy, Paul talks about, hey, it wasn't just me that taught you. It was your mother Lois and your grandmother Eunice. These were the ladies that, that gave you the foundation of your faith. Paul reminds Timothy that others taught him and he needs to carry that on to the next generation. We're here today with a call to teach the next generation. Everyone from the oldest one here to the youngest one here, we are called to teach the next generation. We must take that opportunity seriously because God has commanded us to do so. And finally, Paul closes out this thought with the source of these teachings, which is God's holy word. Everything contained in this work is the inspired word of God and should be treated with the honor and respect that it deserves. Notice the purpose of God's word should be in our life that it should have in our lives. First of all, it's teaching. It's what we're doing here tonight. It's what we should be doing in our homes with our families. It's what we should be doing with our friends. Teaching God's Word. Sitting down, one-on-one, -on -one, going through Scripture. What does this mean to you? How does this apply to my life? Teaching God's Word. Second, rebuking and correcting. is calling sin what it is and then bringing the sinner back to Christ. It's not judging the person for who it is that, and what they're doing, but it's pointing to truth. Is pointing to that person's failure to meet Christ's standard. But it's also not condoning 
that action. It's not saying, it's not making it anything less than what it is, which is a failure to meet God's standard. You see, rebuking points to a sin as the, and its result in obedience. Correcting is the act of bringing that sinner back to Christ. Scripture must do both. And finally, it's training in righteousness. It's teaching the correct way to live. We've got to look at Scripture and not only point to the bad things of, of what sin is in our life, but it must be also point to, if you're going to give this up, then you need to live out this way instead. Once we have a good understanding of what God's Word says about sin, and we've been rebuked for the sin in our lives and pointed back to a right relationship with Christ, we should be given guidance on how to continue to live that right relationship with Him. So the point to all of this that Paul writes in verses 10 through 17 is to be a complete follower of Christ. That's what he wants for Timothy and that's what he wants for us today is to go and do the good work so that we are equipped to go and do the good work that God has called us to do. So I want to ask you tonight, does that describe you? First of all, are you prepared for the hill that's before you? Are you prepared for the times that are coming, the difficult times that are coming? If you're not, I pray that, that you will become prepared because the first way to be prepared is to have Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior. That's the, that's the first step of being prepared. And if you don't have that, then there's no way you can be prepared for the rest of it. Are you prepared for the hard days that are going to come? And the second thing is, do you have the encouragement of Christ? Do you have the encouragement of Paul's example? Do you have the encouragement of someone in your life to help you through this time? If you don't, I pray that you will find that right relationship with Christ, that you will find His encouragement. I pray that you will seek Paul's words words of Scripture as a whole, as an encouragement in your life. I pray that there will be someone here within this church, within this community, that will encourage you for the hill that's coming. If you need encouragement, our office is open every day of the week. You have my number, you have Brother Tim's number, you have Brother Ken's number, you have Trisha's number. Contact us. We want to offer encouragement wherever we can. Because we understand that as a church body, we're not meant to do this alone. We are a family that are meant to go up this hill together. And I encourage us to do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank You for all that You do for us. God, the hill that is before us, these last days, God, they can be scary. They can be frightful. They can be, we know that they're going to be difficult. God, we don't know what these last days are going to look like what, from this point forward. We don't know what it's going to look like. We look at our world today and we think, how can it get any worse? But God, obviously it can because you haven't returned yet. But God, when that day comes, I pray that we're prepared. I pray that every person in the sound of my voice tonight has a personal relationship with you and they are able to prepare their life for what is coming next. God, I pray that, that we as a church body, we can be an encouraging body to those around us, not only those who are here tonight, but those who are not able to be here tonight for whatever reason. God, I pray that we can be a church body that goes out and encourages others through our lives through the model that Paul has given us, through the encouragement that you give each one of us. God, as we leave here tonight, I pray that we would each uh, go out into our everyday life tomorrow. We would seek opportunities to serve you, that we would seek opportunities to give you glory. It's your name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.